Welcome back to the Shema podcast, my friends. I have a very exciting episode for you. You know, there's something that we're all needing in our in our desire, in our in our purpose, in our growth, in our spiritual growth. And for and it takes these two components. You know, many of you who listen, you know, we have these conversations and your Baal Teshuvah is like myself, um, where something stirs you awake that makes you want to pursue your Judaism and learn Torah. And one of the things we talk quite a lot about is the fact that we have these like two components that God gave us. One is that internal desire to come close to God. That's something that, that feeling of purpose and excitement that brings meaning to our life. But we talk a lot about how God created vessels to hold that that passion, that excitement as we pursue him. And those vessels are the mitzvot and the halakha that surround them. Now, one of the things that's interesting about today is that, and Rabbi Yacobian spoke about this in the episode we did a few weeks ago, Living in the Era of Mashiach, where there's so many Baal Teshuvah coming forward now, and unlike in previous generations, where that was forced through external factors of pogroms and the Holocaust and all these things that caused Jews to go back to their communities and learn Torah. Now it's just happening when Jews are out in the secular world and they're succeeding and they have all the material uh, wealth and success that they could imagine. They're accepted by the community around them, but something stirs them awake. And so what we do with that passion desire is we harness it, we channel it to that vessel of the mitzvot and the halakha. But there's, there's an idea here that we have to remember. And this applies to the other part of the audience who grew up learning and understanding the mitzvot and understanding halakha. And that is, for those of us who are bal teshuvas, or are, are bal teshuvas, if we go back, all of us, to previous generations, there was, whether it's our grandparents, our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents, we had family that kept and lived by Torah law and learned Torah and observed mitzvot, but something broke apart. And the same thing is happening today. You have people growing up in a Torah-observant community, learning Torah and the halakha, and something is causing them to move away from it. And what is that? The Torah and the mitzvot and the halakha, are, as I said, are like the vessels. It is the how to live a Jewish life. But the why is that passion, desire to understand why we live this lifestyle, why we follow the Torah, what it is that, that we're really trying to accomplish. And what breaks things apart is when both are not there. You know, there was a prophecy uh, in the Zohar on the Parsha Noach. And it talks about how, as it's parallel, uh, paralleling, as it's, as it's discussing the, the flood that occurred where waters came from below and waters came from above, that in the future, in the year that equates in the Gregorian calendar of 1840, that there would be a second flood. Except this time it wouldn't be water. It would be a form of water. What we refer to as Torah is analogous to water that there be wisdom from above, Torah knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and there be knowledge from below, the scientific knowledge, understanding how the physical world operates. And those two would converge and bring Torah throughout the world. And the knowledge from above that occurred back then was this Hasidic thought, starting with the Baal Shem Tov, and, and continues on to this day. And the scientific knowledge is really what we're experiencing today as you're watching this through this medium of technology. And so I thought it'd be appropriate to discuss some of the Hasidic wisdom and especially about the teachings of Rabbi Nachman, the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. So I brought, I'm bringing someone on, Rabbi Yokov Klein, who is spreading the wisdom of Rabbi Nachman, who has written uh, some amazing books, the most latest one, The Story of Our Lives, and da- analyzing the sto- Rabbi Nachman's story of the lost princess. So we'll bring him on, and we're going to get to know Rabbi Klein and talk a little about his book. Thank you so, Rabbi, so much for having me. 
So nice to have you on. It's a privilege. I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, what uh, your background, what got you into studying uh, the teachings of Breslov in that, that area of Hasidic thought. Sure. Sure. And I think your introduction already covered so much. I'm not sure, you know, sometimes the Talmud says, if you, if you add, you're taking away. So much of what you spoke about with regard to a certain feeling among those who live and were brought up and experienced the entirety of their lives, that sort of halachic and communal infrastructure that's unique to Orthodox Jews to a Torah lifestyle there's oftentimes a feeling among spiritually sensitive people that the why can oftentimes go missing. And this was a feeling that I had from a very young age. I'm still at a very young age, but even younger, if you could imagine such a thing. And, um, you know, I, I just had this feeling all the time, all the time, all the time. I had a very, and I have, I believe, I hope that I held on to it, a poetic, a creative soul mm -hmm. that was yearning for something very broad, something very deep, something very spiritual that... I felt wasn't necessarily being fostered in a conscious way right. throughout, you know, the, the, the journey of the particular yeshivas that I learned in, wonderful yeshivas, phenomenal people, special people, and I gained a tremendous amount from them. But perhaps there was a certain feeling on the part of those that were running these institutions that it was a given. You know, there were certain elements that were a given, you know, that the why, that the emuna, that some of the understandings of what it is to be a Jew was, was sort of given. And now let's get down to the practicalities of exactly right. how we're supposed to go ahead and do this thing. It was assumed that it was, that yeah, was, it was already assumed there. Either it came right. from the house or it came from, and, yeah. and in many cases it did. But there was still a feeling that because there was a certain assumption that that was going to already be there. And so much of like a top heavy focus just on the element of, you know, academics and learning and understanding and hair splitting and dialectics and so on and right. so forth, that a certain perspective began to form around that. That was very institutional in nature, right. very societal, cultural in nature, that a little bit obscured a lot of that soul, a lot of that essence. Right. And that was something that I, that, I, that I picked up on and that I felt and it bothered me terribly. I don't know that I was able to you know, put it into words like I am now. And I still struggle sometimes because it's ethereal by nature, but it was, right. it was a lack. It was a perception that all is not, is not right, you know, and, that, right. and that this is not the ideal vision that Akadosh Baruch the master of the world <clears throat> had in creating the world and putting this thing called the Jewish nation in the world to spread a light unto the nations, but first to foster that light in and, of, and among themselves. And so I, I, I struggled for a great many years. Um, I'm privileged enough to have been brought up in a home where a lot of these ideas were there. They were right. present. I think the dissonance between my Breslov upbringing, because my father, he has a whole story in and of himself, how okay. he became close to Breslov, maybe for another time, a fascinating story. But we grew up with these ideas. We grew up with the concepts of Rabbi Nachman, a lot of Rabbi Nachman's stories, The Lost Princess, I grew up with. It was told to me at bedtime, you know, and I, and I, would, I would read the English version with the illustrated pictures. I would read it as a child. We grew up with these ideas. I think the dissonance between what I was getting at home and what I was or wasn't getting in the schools was also a challenge, a struggle for me. But ultimately, for one reason or another, that wasn't the point where I was able to feel as if, okay, this is the answer. On the contrary, sometimes I felt like it further obscured things and complicated right. exactly, well, what, what is it? And what, what are we trying to do as Orthodox Jews, right. as Torah Jews? What, what, what's the goal? Um, but it wasn't until much later on. Until much later on, when I was in Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael in Israel, I went, you know, to learn there at 17 years old. I had skipped eighth grade, and so I graduated a year early at 17. And it was a great combination of factors. Obviously, the master of the world has his plan. But I think that it was the independence and the necessity for me to take personal responsibility over my own growth. It was like a aha moment when I realized that I'm in charge of my life. And, right. you know, I, I couldn't expect to be educated beyond how I would self-educate. And um, there was a moment actually, I remember very distinctly, I don't think I've spoken about this actually, or told this story publicly, but um, there, was a, there was a point where I was very, very fascinated with the novels of Stephen King. It was okay. like a horror, like a thriller, yeah. right, I believe, right? Like yeah. a horror writer, you know? Um, and um, I, was reading these, I was reading these books and I noticed how often he would quote biblical texts he was quoting from Job and he was quoting from this one and that one. And right. me as an Orthodox Jew 
was completely clueless in a lot of the texts that he was quoting. And I said to myself, I remember this moment very starkly. It was like a, it was, it was a little bit of a shock. Yeah. And it hurt me. I said, how could it be that this person right. knows things? Where it, it's not even his. It's mine. It's our, yeah, yeah. It's our tradition. I know nothing about it. Right. And that, that was a moment where I was like, hold on one second. I really don't know anything. I don't know anything. And here I am again, you know, the Orthodox Jew that a lot of perhaps Bali Chuva, who right. themselves know a lot more in certain cases because of their own studies and their own openness and authenticity and sincerity than a lot of those that they're trying to be like, which we'll get into in a minute, I presume. Yeah. You know, there, there, there was a feeling like, wait, like I, I have to learn and I have to. And, and then I started to explore and I started to open different svarim and slowly but surely, by divine grace, I managed to take this path through 18th century Ukraine. And through these villages and through these Hasidic courts where I found that exactly the feeling that I had growing up and was unable to articulate was being articulated perfectly, clearly, lucidly in right. all of these works. And the Hasidas came to treat this very issue 200 years ago. But today, the message is more prevalent than ever. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about the Breslov movement and, sure. and, and some of those people you get because a lot of the audience may not be familiar with that. But I think one of the things I want the audience to understand too is that like even though I'm, you know, just moving to the community a year ago, right. new in my observance, I'm even seeing like things that happen to me. Like when the first time, like seven years ago, where I learned the brakas on each of the food, it was so exciting. Like, okay, this go from the ground, this go from a tree, I'd research it, and I'd get so excited and I would say the braca and eat it. It was like the most exciting thing, you know, knowing that what I'm doing. And now I find myself just, did I say the Braca? Right. What did I say? Did I say the right one? Why I'm chewing the food. And right. I'm, I can already see that can start to happen where you lose Absolutely. some of that excitement and why I found Rabbi Nachman's teaching to be so beneficial yeah. in all those ways. But talk to the audience a little bit about, you know, uh, the Breslov teachings and sure. sort of the history of that. Sure. You know, so it was an interesting thing. Again, God runs the world in mysterious ways. And every person has their their entry point, whether it's to Breslov, whether it's to Hasidus, whether it's to... Torah Judaism, whether it's to, whatever it is, every right. per, there's there's always a million doors, you know. So I was privileged enough, just on a familial level, meaning from having been brought up in a family where Breslov was a thing, you know, and right. I was made fun of for being Breslov even before I knew what it was at all, you know. But at least I was <laughs> Breslov enough to, to have to have had people, oh, the Breslover, you know. I don't right. know what it was in high school. Certain teachers you wouldn't believe, right? That when I when I encountered in in Israel a little bit of perhaps a different angle on Breslov than that that I had been familiar with or at a, at a stage in my life where I was open to it, you know, when I was confused enough and knowing that I needed clarity and was open to hearing. So I think earlier on, I might have not, you know, not even if I would have been exposed to those ideas. Every person has, like calls man ve'es, Shlomo Melech says, you know, there's a time for everything. Right. Every person has their time and, and before that it doesn't happen. And, and after that, you know, that's when things happen. So. At that moment, there was a certain personal connection where I said, this is mine. I remember being in the city of Tzfat, Safed, mm -hmm. where they have a very, very large Breslov community. We had gone there with our yeshiva, whole group of guys in the school where I was, where I was learning in the program in Israel. We went up to, uh, to Tzfat, and I would say a substantial group of us went to pray the Friday night services, Kabbalah, Kabbalah Shabbat, Kabbalah Shabbos by the Breslov or Hasidim, and they're beautiful, beautiful. I don't know if, you, if you're ever at the privilege of being there. Yes. Beautiful base medrash, gorgeous, high ceilings, big place, very, very, a certain, a certain grace on the, on the people, yeah. you know, a certain way that they look and carry themselves and they live in, in this hilltop city. It's, it's just a certain vibe there. Right. And, and I remember having this feeling of pride that this is mine, meaning because, you know, from home. And, and so right. a little bit, you know, the foundation was laid even back then. Yeah. So I felt myself particularly drawn to this, to this Hasidus. And I started, I started to learn, you know, and, and I was privileged after that trip to come back to Jerusalem where our yeshiva was. And I was looking very much for a sort of tzvat in Jerusalem. And I, I, wanted, I wanted some of that energy, some of that vibe. And there was a particular base medrash, there was a particular house of study, which had that sort of very you know, more abstract, more colorful, diversity, not, not by the books, you know, it's what it is, you know, it's a, a city of hippies, essentially, you know, so <laughs> it was, it was a place like that. And there, I think I was exposed for the first time, there was a person giving a shir in Yiddish, which because of my background, I understand, I can't speak a few words of Yiddish, right. but I understood Yiddish. Yeah. And, uh, and I sat on a bench in the back and I started to listen to this shir by this uh, Magid shir, you know, the, the person giving the, the lecture of the class, mm -hmm. his name was Rav Frank. 
Okay. This last night I did an event with him actually in, in Lakewood, okay. in New Jersey. And he was teaching from Rabbi Nachman's teachings, Lakute Maran. Fireworks were going off in my mind. Yeah. I mean, I had never heard, I never heard such a thing, such ideas. And, and the way that this particular person speaks also, there was a certain confidence and a clarity and a, a lucidity and a hope and a joy and a sanity and a normalcy and a balance and a, and a, and a synthesis. It was, it was everything that I felt. I, I, I just, you know, sometimes like Chazal say, Nikarim divrei emes. When you encounter truth, you just know it. You right. know, it, it's something, it does something to you. Yes. And I said, this is it, this is mine. I went right from there to the, to the, to the Breslau bookstore. I bought myself a, a copy of Lukut Maran. I opened it to the first page and that was it. That was like, that was it. And, and over the years, it's been, it's been a relationship. You know, Rabbi Nachman is not just, he was some scholar and we learn his works in an academic way. And there are those that do that, it's unfortunate. It's, it's a personal relationship. Rabbi Nachman put himself, he said, I put myself in my teachings. And if a person is related to this on a soul level, yeah. and I'm sure that there are some people that aren't and they'll find their path their way. But in our generation, a great many of us are. Right. We belong to Rabbi Nachman, and he captures us. He captures us through his stories. He captures us through his poems, through his visions, through his teachings, through his wisdom. He captures us, and we feel deep inside. Even if we can't articulate or explain it, we say, this is it. This right. is what I've been looking for. And so I very much had that experience, and it's been a, it's been a roller coaster whirlwind ever since. Amazing. Yeah, I, the, the way Rabbi Nachman, his teachings, it's not like you're just, uh, you know, reading something in the dry form with here's what to do, but it's it's speaking to you as right. if you're asking someone, what do I do in this situation, you know? And he sort of organizes his teachings in that way that if you're struggling with X, No matter this. what you're looking for, it's like, it's like a pharmacy. Yeah. No matter, what you, no matter what you need, at right. any point, at any stage, in the winters and summers of the human experience, there's something there for you. That, that the, many of his books are just being pulled off the bookshelf normally throughout the year, you know, That's as right. I'm struggling with something and That's right. the answers are right there. Um, so you've written some books prior to the, the book you've currently written. Talk a little bit about the, some of the books you've written on sure, the subject. Sure, sure. So in the beginning, when I was getting a little bit closer to Hasidus and discovering this path and embracing it and understanding it and exploring it, and it's a whole world in and of itself with all the different dynasties and masters and teachings and paths and revelations, it, it itself, it's not, you can't just say Hasidus. You know, every court is, its own, is a whole kingdom, it's a whole world, it's a whole yeah. philosophy. It's, so when I, when I started to explore that world, Beginning really with Breslov, I found this very, very unique element in Breslov that I hadn't seen in other places, where Nussan of Breslov, who was Rabbi Nachman's primary disciple, mm -hmm. wrote a work called Lakute Eitzis, which okay. means a collection of advice. This collection of, adv uh, of advice wasn't a work that was separate from the other major Breslov works. What it did was, basically, it took Rabbi Nachman's Lakute Maran, which is his magnum opus, filled with the deepest, deepest teachings, Kabbalistic teachings, philosophical teachings, and it drew from each lesson the practical advice. Right. Lukute Eitz is a collection of advice, but again, it's not new. It's not something, it's Lukute right. Maran, practical. Right. How, how do we take these abstract ideas and these beautiful concepts, how do we apply them? That was fresh to me. I said, whoa, you know, it's not just about the intellect. It's about, it's about the transformation that these ideas are supposed to have on us. At that same time, I was learning the Sefer Kedushas Levi from Rav Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. He was one of the early Hasidic masters, third generation, a student of the Magad of Mizrich, who himself was the spiritual heir of the Baal Shem Tov. At the same time as Rabbi Nachman, they were very, very dear friends, and it wasn't so simple to be Rabbi Nachman's dear friend. He put up with a tremendous amount of opposition, which is a separate conversation exactly from whom and why. But they were very, very close, and that Sefer spoke to me, that work spoke to me. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, just before we get into the teachings, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev is known as the defense attorney of the Jewish people, the advocate of the Jewish nation. In Hebrew, it's Sani Goran Shal Yisrael. To my knowledge, there is no other figure throughout Jewish history who shares this title, persona, the defense attorney of the Jewish nation. What does it mean? Yes, what does that mean? What does it mean, the defense attorney of the Jewish nation? He made it his business to argue with God over decrees and over harsh realities in the lives of Jews, to go ahead and to find any tiny advocacy that he could sometimes even manipulate, sometimes even generate, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Yeah. He would bring that to God in a way that was unheard of. He would speak and relate to God as if he was a friend having, having a, a banter. Right. And he would try to, arc, he, he would try to orchestrate events that would, that, would, that would enable 
a point of what, what, what's called limut schus, a point of merit to emerge specifically because of the way that he set things up and he would grab it and bring that to God and say, see, look at your, so I'll give you an example. Yes. There are so yes. many stories, but one example is that, is that Rav Yitzhak Berditch was once walking to shul, to the synagogue, on one of the most stringent fasts of the, of the, of the Jewish calendar, Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, right? Okay. Outside of Yom Kippur, it's the most stringent fast. These two days, it's very, very intense. It was a day of horrible calamities for the Jewish nation. Both temples were destroyed on that day. Throughout Jewish history, it's a day of darkness. Right. It's also a day of great light. That's a separate conversation. The darkness is only a concealment. Our sages say that Mashiach is actually born on Tisha B'Av. So right. from within the darkness, that's where the light emerges. But be that as it may, it's a severe and stringent fast, and there are very, very few exceptions, you know, in accordance with Jewish law of who's allowed to be eating on that day. Right. Now, in the city of Berdichev at that time, there was the movement of the Enlightenment. There were many, many, many of those who were shirking, you know, this lifestyle for in, in favor, or so they hoped, right. of gaining favor, currying favor with the secular, you know, surroundings because they felt that the reason why they were being persecuted so was because of their differences. We know that it was the opposite, right? And the more Jews try to be like the world, the more they hate us and a Jew is a Jew and there's no, right. no getting around it. Exactly. In a certain way, they're waiting for us to embrace our Jewishness because in a, in a very, very deep way, they want something from us because they know that we're here to give them something and they, and, they, and they feel broken that we're not doing what we're supposed to do. Right. And so they want, they, they, they're, they're, in a certain way that the spiritual root of anti-Semitism is, is this feeling of, like, of, of, of discouragement, like you're in this world to give me something, give it to me. And right. if you're not giving it to me, I'm gonna hate you for it. And in a certain way, they're right, you know, right. because we, we're supposed to be a light into the nations. First, we have to discover the light for ourselves though. Then we can bring it to the world that's so desperate for it. But Rabbi yeah. Yitzhak is walking to shul and he okay. sees one of these enlightenment figures and he's very brazenly standing outside on Tisha B'Av eating a piece of bread in the street, publicly. So the Rav, you know, the rabbi, <laughs> the judge, the, the Abbezin, he has to say something, right? So he right. went over to him and he said, you know, my dear brother, he said, you must not know that it's Tisha B'Av today. You know, I must have forgotten. Right. He says, no, no, I didn't forget. I know, I know it's Tisha B'Av and I'm eating. So Rav Yitzhak says, wow, he says, I must be that you're deathly ill and that's why you have to eat. No, I'm, I'm in the peak of, you know, peak of my health, perfect <laughs> physique, I'm doing fine. And this goes a couple of other times where Olivia looks trying to find some, you know, excuse. redeeming, yeah, some excuse right. to justify right. and each one, you know, brazenly, no, uh, you know, I, I don't have any excuse. I'm, and I'm eating on Tisha B'Av. So at that moment, Olivia Yitzhak looks up to the heavens and he says, master of the world, look down at your Jewish nation, see how precious they are. They'd rather admit and bring upon themselves the shame of committing a sin than tell a lie. Beautiful. That's how he right. turned that, he reframed yeah. that situation. Exactly. Again, was he naive or was he privy to a little bit of a deeper level of right. depth that was even beyond the surface? Right. I, I wrote an article about that once, the advocacy of Rebbe Yitzchak. But there were so many stories like that. So Rebbe right. Yitzchak was this personality that's so endearing to Jews because don't we all need that? Don't we all need someone in our life who's gonna analyze our actions, behaviors and mistakes and right. errors and somehow shine a different light onto it to show us that, you know, something we're trying, we're trying to do what we can. Right. You know, so that was really, it's like, so his teachings drew me and because- I'll say that a lot, a lot of what happens with the Jewish people is, is basically how we analyze, view and judge each other. There's so much in the heavens exactly that, right. that hinges. It's all perspective. On that. Yeah. It's all per the deepest secret of life is perspective. The deepest secret of life is perspective because we're all given the same set of facts, but it's how we interpret those facts right. that makes all the difference, right? right. Like I mentioned before, Reb Nassim wrote a Lakute Eitzes on Lakute Maran, bringing out the practical advice. Now, okay. when I was learning Reb Levi Yitzchak's teachings in, in Kedusha Slevi, I said to myself, you know, you can really do the same thing on Kedusha Slevi. You can bring out the practical advice from each piece. I was revealing levels in the Torah, you know, verses that seemed completely irrelevant to me, how it was speaking to me and the, and the deeper secrets and nothing's you know, on the surface, the King James, you know, translation. I mean, it's, it's infinite, infinite depth. It's eternal depth. It was, oh, you know, expanding my mind in two billion ways. And I, and, and, I, and I said to myself, you know, let me try to do that. Let me try to extract the advice. So it started first, I'll tell you the story. It, st it first yeah. started on a computer as a Microsoft Word document that I was foolishly, maybe it was even before you can save things to the cloud, I don't know, but I had it on a, on a USB. Okay. I had worked about three quarters of the year. Every week, I would pick two pieces from, you know, from his discourses on that week's parsha Torah reading, and I, would, and I would try to do this in English just to bring it down to earth, 
not right. a translation, but to try to extract some of the ideas, bring from some other, you know, thinkers on the on the topic and bring it, you know, down, like they say, Lu'uv de la Maisa, practically, down into this world. Right. After Pesach, Passover, I was a student then. I was seven, I was, I think I was about 18 years old when I was writing this project. And uh, I flew home and we were in Miami. My sister was making a, making a simcha bar mitzvah or something. And so the family flew down there and I lost the USB. I didn't oh, have no. it saved anywhere else. We're talking about hours the, upon hours yeah. upon hours, gone, gone. I still remember what the USB looked like, gone. I was broken, yeah, I mean. For sure. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was tough. But I was able to dig into the wellspring of the very teachings that I was trying to bring out to find encouragement and to find emuna, to find right. faith. This is Everything also for the good. Reason. This has happened for a reason. Yeah. And I said, I'm just going to start again. But this time I got smart. I said, I'm going to write the book, not where it's contained on some USB that can get lost. I'm going to do it as a weekly email. That way, everybody's already benefiting from it. It's right. saved forever. If yeah. I delete it, someone else has it. They can send it to me. Right. And so that's how Sparks from Baditcha was born. It was just emails you know, weekly for an entire year. Right. Before I knew it, I had a 500 page book and I edited it, edited it, you know, the manuscript and I sent it to fellow time publishers and they accepted it, they invested in it. Without that, nothing would have started. I was 18, nothing, wow. nothing happened. They accepted it, it took a, it was a, yeah. it was a long process, you know, the editing and the publication process. But that's, that, that's what started things for me. You so know? How long ago was that? This is about eight, nine years ago. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was published when I was 22, you know, so they did they, they take, I wrote, I wrote it between 18, 19, and then the process, you know, so right. that was, yeah, was, that was, when it was published was about, yeah, it was about five, five years ago or so. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. And what, and you've written, uh, uh, right. So that was the first, that was, okay. that was Sparks from Redditch. The second one was called Sunlight of Redemption, which is back to Brasov on the very first lesson in Rabbi Nachman's Lekutim Aran. The lesson okay. in the Hebrew original is one page. It's like a 300 page book, you know, on, on one page. And it's just beginning to scratch the surface of the surface of the surface, just a little bit, little hints of, uh, you know, trying to explain it. It's infinite, 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 infinite. That was the second. And then the third, which is my whole thing now, the story of the lost princess. Right, let's talk about that. Sure. Um, so you said you you were reading this story or as a family when you were a young kid. That's right. Uh, yeah. Were you able to like absorb, like really the, the in-depth meaning of it? Because the, the first time I read it, you had to like do a double take and go back yeah. and like, what, what's he trying to, it's very encrypted. Very, very cryptic. No, I, I didn't, there was no, there was no, I mean, I, I love the illustrations. Uh, somebody wrote David Sears did all the beautiful illustrations of that children's edition. I don't right. know if you ever saw the, the Breast of right. Research Institute. It's good to get, you know, okay. it's, it's just, it's enjoyable. Um, I enjoyed the illustrations. I enjoyed the mystique. Who are these three people carrying big trees? Right. What does it mean that the story has no ending? So I, I did, and I, and I remember, like, it wasn't, you know, and this is, again, the way God works. I mean, like, I should happen to find that book and learn it and read it. And then years later, it was already all encoded that I would make of the story and the whole world would be, you know, it's, it's amazing. You know, but I, I remember it wasn't just once that I read this story. I would go back to it and read it and read it and read it and be, again, intrigued, not right. aware of the, of the depth. I think that the message, and we'll tell the story in short in a minute, yeah. I think the message, generally speaking, is pretty straightforward in the sense that you don't give up, you know, and there's going right. to be moments where you fail. And oftentimes the moments where we fail is at the at the, at the the moment that we thought we're going to make it, you know, and we're doing great and we're, we're about to reach the next level. And then we get side, you know, blindsided. And right. so the message of perseverance, the message of hope, yeah. those were things that resonated for sure. You know, as a kid who was being bullied terribly, terribly, terribly in school, I needed that, and some yeah. I don't know that I drew a direct connection, but it certainly resonated for sure. Yeah, um, but this, all, but all Rabbi Nachman's t t teachings, a lot of it is about that. That that's that's why I took from the story early on. Yeah, because I I tell people all the time that I became a Torah observant Jew over thirty times because as I was learning and trying to figure out how to do things, right. you know, I would uh, I would think I was there, and then I would start studying some more and realize oh, you're doing all this wrong. You know something? If you're doing it right, that process will last until 120. <laughs> that's I'm, I'm still learning how to be an observant Jew. I really am. That, that's true. Really that's am. an idea too, is that we're really, we're all, we're all we're, on, we're on a journey. We're on we're a journey. journey. That's, it, it, that's exactly right. That's right. And that's why those stories teach. But let's talk about, like, why don't you talk about the, the story itself and let's start to break apart. Sure, sure. The, okay, so let, let's tell the story first. Okay. Just, uh, it's a little bit longer, so just very, very short without all, every single tiny detail. Yeah. But the general story is that there was a king who had six sons and one daughter, six princes and a princess. 
Rabbi Nachman tells us that he would spend a lot of time with the princess. She was very precious to him. And one day, we don't know exactly, they were together on, on Eza Yom and some day, uh -huh. on a certain day, and he gets angry with her. And he says words that are unfathomable, you know, certainly in the context of the preciousness with which he related to her. He says, may the no good one take you. Terrible curse, may the no good one take you away. And the, the next morning she's gone. And basically, even though the story is called The Lost Princess, it should really, be, in a certain way, it should be called The Searching Viceroy. Because it's right. all about, the bulk of the story is not about the princess. The bulk right. of the story is about this viceroy, the second in command, this individual, who makes it his life mission, maybe many lifetimes, right? Years and years and years. Right. You know, slept for 70 years, and then he's dirting for it. You know, so many lifetimes. He devotes himself to finding the print, to locating her and bringing her home. And the whole story is about that process. The whole story is about what he needs to go through. And so very simply, searching through deserts, fields, and forests, all kinds of different topographies. Of course, there's incredible depth in every single element. We'll speak about some of that. And finally, he finds what's called a shvil matzad. A small path to the side leads into a palace. And even though there's soldiers outside, he goes and he settles his mind and he says, let me try. They don't stop him. He goes into the palace and he's going from room to room till he comes to a big ball, sits down in a corner, sees what's going to happen. And they bring in the queen of this place, of this palace. Mm -hmm. And it's the princess, right? And she recognizes him. He recognizes her. And she gives him a set of conditions that he needs to do in order to free her. Now, these are not conditions that are like, you know, a military sort of, uh, you know, extraction. Right. Because it's a, all things a spiritual concept. And so there's spiritual guidelines. He has to pick for himself, you know, pick a, pick a, pick a place, stay there for a year. The last day he's not allowed to eat anything, yearn for her. And, and fast, and, and he does this right. until the last day where he starts to walk back to the palace. He's ready. He did everything right. He's going to free her, bring her home, and he sees this beautiful apple tree, right? It's like a fairy tale. It's like right. the Brothers Grimm, right? Snow White. He sees a beautiful apple tree, and he can't hold himself back The temptation. And he takes an apple, and he takes a bite, and he falls asleep. This happens again the second time. This time she tells him not to drink wine and he's on his way back. It's the last day of the year again, the second year. And he sees this flowing river and it's red and he wonders, is it water, is it wine? And he drinks from it and he falls asleep. Right. And this goes on, this goes on until the princess needs to come to him. And she says, I'm no longer in this place. Now I've been moved to a palace of pearls on a golden mountain. And so now his mission is to go ahead. There are other details in, the, in the between, but his mission is to find this. And he searches and searches and searches. The whole thing is about searching for long periods of time. Only with this promise that he holds in his hand that such a place exists, he'd never seen it. But there's a faith that this exists, that it's real, what he's searching for. And he encounters giants, a series of three giants, each mm -hmm. of whom are carrying gigantic trees. And they're trying to convince him it's folly. What you're looking for doesn't exist. And the first one is in charge of all the animals in the world. And he calls them. And he says, did any of you see a, a, you know, a palace of pearls on a golden mountain? They say, no, we didn't see it. You say, we see? Doesn't exist. The next giant is in charge of all the birds. And he calls them. And he says, did any of you see you fly up high in the sky? Did you see this? None of them saw it. Finally, the third giant is in charge of all the winds of the world. And they go everywhere, even where birds can't go. And he asks them the same question. They didn't see it. And then at the very, very, very end, when the viceroy is about to give up because he's been so trampled upon, because he's so, so wrapped up in this, on the one hand, internal certainty, but being, yeah. being denied right. Right, by those that he respects. That's the representative of giants, gigantic people, big people, right. wise people, you know, intellectual people. And they're telling him it doesn't exist. At that very, very, very moment when he breaks down into tears, one last wind comes and the giant gets angry at it and he says why didn't you come with all the other winds and he says because i was carrying a princess to a golden mountain and a palace of pearls right and so okay so now he's validated and it takes him there and Ibn Ahmed then really leaves off the ending in a cryptic way by saying in the end he freed her he doesn't say how but in the end almost like an afterthought like right. what do you mean that's all that's all point of the story no it's not it's not right because the journey is the point right it's not about exactly. the results it's about the journey yeah now I had always, like I said, I had always loved this story. Loved it. Loved it. Loved the imagery. And the Rebbe Nachman was so poetic and artistic. And he was, even, even, even among the secular literary circles, you know, right. in, in colleges worldwide, they're studying his, 
you know, his teachings, not yeah. for their spiritual import, but just for the literary creativity. It's unheard of. And he wasn't a person who studied in college. He lived in a small, backward, tiny little shtetl and, you know, in a small yeah. little village in Ukraine. But his mind was infinitely, infinitely journeying, you know? And this right. is, this is, I would say, one of the least imaginative of his 13 tales. Right. It's one of the shortest and it's one of the least. I mean, the other stories are, they span, you know, centuries and- There's, there's so much compacted in oh that Oh my gosh, story. you know, it's beyond time, beyond space. So, and, uh, so let's talk about, so like, so what you just said at the end was important because, yeah. you know, we're, uh, our, our, the story of our lives do not end with some climatic, uh, you know, uh, scene. Resolution. Right. Yeah, resolution. There's no resolution. Uh, with explosions in the background. Yeah, just fireworks. Out. And, <laughs> or, or, right, or that, or that, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the whole story of life is this ongoing process, which That's is right. something that um, it's good just to recognize that, that it's always going to be one challenge and another challenge, but they're, they're all ascending and That's we're right. all growing That's as right. a result. That's right. That's right. So let, let's let's get in even before we get into some of that. Yeah. What is the princess, right? That's that's yeah. a very important element. What, what is it that gets lost? What is it that we're searching for? So we know that the Jewish week is not you know weekdays and weekend. It's the six days of the week and then Shabbos, Shabbat, right? right? We could talk about Shabbos for a long time. Sure, I don't know what you know how much time we have. Or the element of Shabbos, in a nutshell, is a day of faith, because the very premise of Shabbos, which means to rest, Shabbos means to say that there was a God who created the world right. and rested. And so we, in turn, rest. That means that the premise of what we're doing on Shabbos is that we believe that everything we see around us was created by an intelligent, loving being. I think we limit oftentimes our conception of God by calling him God. We created that concept, God, you know, and it's, yeah. it's limited. We call him the infinite one, the Ein Sof. Yeah. We have no perception of what this thing is. Not an old man with a long white beard who's pulling right. strings and hitting people. Right. Ah, it's so much bigger, right? Yeah. Rabbi Nachman once told one of these enlightenment types that he used to play chess with and their friends spend a lot of time with, he said, he said, the God you don't believe in, I don't either believe in. The right. God you don't right. believe in, I don't either right. believe in, right? Because it becomes an argument. Hey, do you believe in God or not? Like, well, hold on one second. What do you mean when you say God? Right. And what exactly. do I mean when we say God, right? right. And so that, that's, that's an interesting conception also to think about. There's so many deep perceptions, not just what you read in a book. I mean, the, it's infinite, there's so much to learn. For me and for you, we're still on the, yeah. we're baderich, right? But there, there's this element of Shabbos, a day of faith, a day of not working, a day of the realization that whatever I did during the week and whatever I thought I earned and the paycheck that I thought I brought home, it was all founded on this, that there's a creator who's in my life and giving me strength that I can breathe, that I can see, that I can feel, that I can perceive, what am I? What, what is this thing? Right. And what's the distinction between me and a corpse? We should all live long and happy till 120, but there's a, yeah. there's a strong difference. What is, a, what is that element and who's giving it to me? It's a miracle, yeah. this thing called the human being. Shabbos gives us pause to be able to sit and reflect on all of that. And so in Rabbi Nachman's story, where we have this concept of six and one, it's clear on the most basic level. Right. The six sons are related to the six days of the week. Okay. And the princess is related to Shabbos. Kabbalistically, Shabbos is feminine in nature without getting to the depth of it, right. related to the, the sphere of Malchus without, without the, the technicalities of it. But the princess is related to Shabbos. The princess is related to faith. The princess is related to the concept of Tachlis. What was the purpose of creation? Shabbos. Right. In the Friday night services, we say, referring to Shabbos, Tachlis Maise Shemaim Va'aretz. The purpose for which all of creation was created was for Shabbos. Now, in our reality, we can only have a little taste of that. But what Shabbos called? Me'in olam haba. It's just a taste of what things are going to look like when the whole world is woken up. Woke, right. you know, in a way of yeah. holiness. Yeah. To, that, to that concept and that consciousness to say, whoa, it's the most obvious thing in the world. But again, it matters and it depends on our perspective. Right. To be able to look around and all of a sudden a walk in the park is not a walk in the park. It's a walk through God. It's a walk through God. It's not a walk in the park. Right. Every tree is godliness. Yeah. And every little blade of grass, and it changes everything to live a life of miracles. The princess gets lost. Meaning to so say, meaning to say, yeah. in our lives, even religiously, because okay. that's what we started the conversation with, there's so much this worldliness, this worldly structure is built around what to do, how to do it right, how to look, how to act, how to speak, how, 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 what, right. when, where. But the why, the tachlis, the big picture, 
purpose. Right. And Muna, God's presence, a relationship with him. Right. That gets lost in the detail sometimes. And Rabbi Nachman's story is all about that. Okay. Right. So the so the six sons are are the the five sons are the days of the week, or the six, the sons, six sons are the days of the, the week. The, That's the right. The days of the week, right? That's right. Um, and, and 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 so with, with without Shabbos they had a ming. So I, I thought I thought there was some element too of the emotive traits and things of that nature. Is that sure? Sure. Is yeah. I, I don't know how it? much time we have. It. There's okay. uh, there's so there's uh, yeah. Okay. That that's the deeper layer to understand okay. that there are really seven lower spherot, right? Okay. There are seven lower powers out of 10 with which God created the world. The first three are more intellectual, just like in a creative process, we first think about what we're gonna do and then we go ahead and do it. The lower seven is this worldliness, right? Okay. So the six sons are, yes, they're the emotive traits, they're more masculine in nature, which is why they're hinted to in, yeah. in, in sons, right? Which are more extroverted physiologically, we're extroverted, right? right? As opposed to the female. Men are always, you know, masculinity is, is external and brawn and, and so on and so on. And feminine, you know, more historically, classically, is is inward is 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 calm is now again there are, there are exceptions to you know to the rule on either side right. but generally speaking yeah. the, the sensitivity and so on and so forth inwardness humility calm uh, stillness all of these are more classically feminine oriented traits all of us have both of them you know women have masculine traits men right. have feminine traits and really the story is about the embrace of the feminine that's really what it is right. it's, it's about, about the return to that element of stillness and i think the most important thing is that you know, there was a very, very great Jewish thinker. His name was A.J. Heschel, Professor Abraham Joshua Heschel, who I okay. quote in the book a lot. A good deal of confusion in the Orthodox world as to what exactly he was. He was a professor in a conservative college, um, but at the same time, he was a, a gigantic, gigantic Talmud, you know, ta Talmudic scholar and, uh, and, and an Orthodox observant Jew his whole life, mm -hmm. at least on, on some level. Again, he's a, he's a confusing, uh, complicated person. But like the Rambam says, you know, Kabul emes mimisha amri. Whoever says truth, take it. Right. And we don't start judging and understanding. His whole family was wiped out in the Holocaust, and he was a complicated figure. But he has this glorious articulation in his book *God in Search of Man* toward the end, where he says about the synergy between the six sons and the princess, which he relates to the concepts of body and soul, that body without the soul is a corpse but soul without the body is a ghost. Right. And God wants human beings. Means to say, if a person only has the element of the princess and just like, okay, I'll meditate on a hilltop and I'll be a very spiritual person, right. but it's divorced from the lived experience of what it looks like in the morning and the afternoon and the night and how it's able to come down into the particularities of our, of our mundanity and, and our obligations right. as human beings lived in this world with the vessels of halacha, with the vessels of Talmud study, with the vessels of Torah study and, and prayer, even, even you know the scripted prayer and so on and so forth. If it's divorced from that, then, it, then it's a ghost. Right. Now, if it's if 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 all we have is that without the without the princess, then it then it's a corpse. Right. And a corpse nobody wants. You know? Right. Exactly. So in comes the the viceroy to right. to define the uh, the lost princess. Right. right. But the the viceroy has some things that the king gives him yeah. for his journey. Let's yeah. let's talk about that because this really gets down to the construct of of who we are. Sure. Uh, what what was lent to us uh, by the Almighty. To take on this this right. uh, this this journey and this this uh, these challenges that's right in our life here, that's right. You know, it's interesting. As I was retelling the story, I left out that that element. That's a very important element. That's a very very important element. Before the viceroy sets out, he asks for three things. He asks for a horse, he asks for a servant, and he asks for money for expenses. These three things: a horse, a servant, money for expenses. It should be clear to you and me that if the viceroy is on a journey to discover the princess, that the princess represents tachlis, Shabbos, faith, the purpose, everything oriented in vis-a-vis -vis and in relation to a broader picture, a broader mission, then <clears throat> the things that he asks for are also going to need to be engaged with through that consciousness because right. he's trying to bring her back. Right. A great deal of the reason why we struggle with the elements hinted to at these three things, which is the horse's bodily health, physicality, yeah. the servant is intellect, clarity, lucidity, mm -hmm. ability to think properly, not foggy, hazy, smart, you know, the ability, intelligent, right. emotionally intelligent or otherwise, intelligence. And money for expenses is straightforward. It means cash, right, right in our right. pocket. 
the reason why we engage with these things often in an unhealthy way, and we become obsessed with money, and we become obsessed with intellect, and we become obsessed with physical, you know, our physicality, right. is itself an indication that we've lost the princess. Meaning to say, right. we aren't able to see those things in relation to a mission. And right. so we get, it's the same thing. We get caught up in the six suns of the six days of the week and the profits that we can accrue and the, and the, and the, and the impressiveness of external structures and what we're able to show people that we accomplish in our portfolio. Right. But we forget about why there are six days of the week in the first place. Right. Ah, because it's all for Shabbos. Right. It's all to bring Shabbos into that experience. It's all to enable those vessels of what it is this worldly success to slowly contribute to the revelation of godliness in the world and the spread of faith so that it should, it should overflow from us, that a person sees us and speaks to us, and we feel as if th there's a presence here that's bigger, that's beyond. Right. That's what we're called upon to do. So it's really, it's real, I mean, the, it, this is about Amuna. I mean, it's, it's all about Amuna. Amuna. It's okay. all about Amuna. So I think that it's so interesting because, you know, what the Yetzirah wants us to do is think that who we are is the horse, the servant, and the money, right. and, and identify with that. So that when the time is up, and the Almighty takes back what he lent us, we'll, we'll come in empty handed, right? That's right. And so I think just that parable, I, understanding what is truly who we are. Um, it's essential. Is, it's essential. It's very important. Because, because I, I believe that the question, you know, who is a Jew, right? Outside of the societal, must necessarily be bound up with the mission statement that was gifted to our entire nation, of which you and I are sparks of one torch, right? And, right. and, 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 and drops in, in one great ocean. It needs to be mission oriented. That's our identity is our mission. That's why we were sent. A lot of people are always asking when they find themselves in certain circumstances, lama, which is a Hebrew word, which means why? Why? And they have questions. Yeah. Why, am I, why am I in this circumstance? Why right. was I given this set of circumstances and experiences and traumas and so on and so forth? But the Hasidic masters teach that with a simple change in vowels, the word can mean something else entirely. Okay. If we pronounce the word not lama, but lima, it goes from meaning why to for what purpose. Right. That changes everything. Because a person can look at a circumstance and say, lama, like why? Right. Or he can start to shift immediately into right. this mission-oriented right. consciousness where it's limma. Here I am in this situation, but I didn't happen to have fallen into this pit. I was sent here. For what purpose? Right. How can I reveal godliness in this world right. now? And so the more that we identify our Jewishness with a mission, and it's not just about things we gotta do and stuff we gotta learn, but it's a trans-historical mission. This means to say that the Jewish nation throughout history has a mandate that gets lost because there are so many things that we got to learn how to do and we can lose the big picture. What, right. what are we here for? Right. What, what right is question. our obligation vis-a-vis -vis the world? Forget about ourselves. Vis-a-vis -vis the world as a nation, then we're able to engage with all of the circumstantial elements and not get caught up in them because we're able to utilize them like the Viceroy as tools to help us accomplish that mission. Okay. So the Viceroy goes through what a lot of us go through. Yeah. where you're in the situation, you ask the right question. I'm here because God wants me, you know, we say the Monday on the end of the morning, he put me here, he gave me the resources. Right. right. He knows I'll be successful. And I don't wanna speak on behalf of all the Jewish people, but quite often I'm like, God, I think you miscalculated this <laughs> one. <clears throat> I'm not ready for this situation. I don't know what to do. Um, I feel like if I, you know, if I go one way, I'll make a mistake. The other way I'll make a mistake. Um, but that's what the story is about. It's sort of so. Let's talk a little bit about the the journey the viceroy go, goes sure. through and, and how to navigate these situations. Sure. sure. You know one of one of the one of the foundational. There are a lot of foundational concepts in the book. You know, every chapter has its new angle and its new perspective. But I think that one of the paradigm shifts, which again is very much associated with almost everything we've been speaking about, yeah. is a shift that occurs when we allow ourselves to become what I call princess-oriented, why-oriented people. And right. what is that shift? The shift relates to how we measure success spiritually. Okay. How we right. measure what's a valuable experience, what's considered a successful experience in relation to our spiritual growth. Okay. Now, if a person is not a why-oriented person, that's not 
attuned to the great mission of the Jewish nation, which is simply to increase the glory of God in the world. Glory in Hebrew is captured in the world in the word kavod, God's honor, right. his glory. But also Heschel says that kavod can mean glory, but it could also connote presence. Okay. Presence. Right. And I found this to be a very, very useful interpretation because presence is something that we can relate to in the sense that yeah. I'm sure all the you know listeners have been in parties and things and social events. When someone with presence enters the room, you feel it. It's a weird thing. Some, yeah. There's an energy shift in the room. The person didn't say anything, do anything. It's presence. Our job is to increase the presence of God in the world by becoming more godly, by enabling ourselves to communicate some of that ineffable glory and some of that some of that transcendent spirit through us and the way that we speak and the way that we think and the way that we act. And the Torah gives us the guidelines as to how to do that and to increase that feeling of presence so that the world wakes up to the very simple calculation that this world must have been created. I didn't make it, you didn't make it. Right. Someone must have made this place. It's more intelligent than anything else. So what was it? It's very simple, it's one plus one. Right. But it's hard because it's, it's not simple. Right. There's, there's a creator, there's a purpose here, right? Yep. So the more, the more, sometimes I go on tangents, I have to get myself back to the main, to the main lot, road. But, yeah, I mean, that's fine. But yeah. the, uh, it, 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 the presence is interesting because it, it really is a lot to do with just, you know, as, as I go into the workday, just recognizing that you're in God's presence. Right. He put me in the situation that you would think, like, you know, take care of that, uh, that PowerPoint presentation, but I don't want anything to do with that. Right. You know, but he's in there. I'm he's in, in there. In he's in there. Where is God in all these situations? And just that recognition, that presence of, re of just uh, uh, being cognizant. That being present. Yeah. Being present, present in the presence. Yes. That's it. Exactly. It's very important. That's very. That's that's that. That's it. That that is it. That that is the mission, right? To 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 be able to draw this down, right? Yeah. Now again, if a person is not aligned with this mission-oriented kind of thinking then it becomes very, very easy to fall into the illusion or even delusion of thinking that spiritual success looks a certain way and is defined by certain set parameters that might externally communicate something that screams success, right? right. When things are going well and I'm able to know the halacha and I'm able to right. do the mitzvot and I'm able to keep Shabbos perfectly right. and I'm able to make sure that I'm up for the morning you know, prayer, shacharis, and, and everything's going right, because we feel that, okay, well that, that you know, I'm doing, I'm doing like the book, what the book says, right. and that's our measure of success. Yeah. But the book brings out the idea that if in every single circumstance that we find ourselves, the question is not lama, but lama, right. then no matter what we're going through, and no matter what life throws our way, and no matter whether, like Rabbi Nachman says, whether it's a time of aliyah, whether it's a time of spiritual elevation, or quite the contrary, like the Viceroy, in that moment yeah. after failure in the lowest place, if we're mission oriented, no matter where we find ourselves on a mountain or in a valley, we ask ourselves lama, meaning to say, yeah. how can I reveal the glory of God in this place? Right. In this place, because I'm mission oriented and that also could be a success. And that changes everything. Right. When a person starts to live on that level, to realize that whether it's in the shul, whether it's in the synagogue, whether it's in front of a, of, of a, of a holy book, or in front of a safer, or whether it's at work, or whether it's with my, with my wife, or playing with the kids on the, on the dining room floor. Right. No, matter, no matter what circumstance it is, there's an opportunity here because there's an obligation. Right. There's an opportunity to reveal the glory of God. And that means that Judaism is supposed to become holistic. It's supposed to be something, right. not that we do, but something that we are that encompasses all of us. Right. Judaism is about not compartmentalizing religious right. life exactly. from the mundane things. Exactly. It's, it's, it's integrating everything together. Exactly right. So the visceral one of the things he encounters is these uh, these giants yeah. with these uh, with these giant trees on their shoulders. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. That's right. And what they symbolize. That's right. You know, I, I should have began with the caveat that any interpretation we're giving is only a, a suggestion, like right. a, a very far suggestion. There's infinite, 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 infinite suggestion. I was just reading a letter from Reb Nassan of Breslev, Rabbi Nachman's primary disciple we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. And um, it's right in the beginning of his collected letters. It's called Alum Latrufa, Healing Leaves. Beautiful, beautiful letters that he wrote to his children and beautiful guidance, clarity. And um, one of those early letters, his son had apparently sent him an interpretation on this story 
that his friend had written. And Rav Nassim okay. said, he said, he said, he said, I'm enlivened just by the fact that someone put time into interpreting this story. He said, between me and you, it's very far from the truth. <laughs> but he said, I still love it. Like he's right. like, you know, I'm into it. And he yeah. said, on some level, it's true. But there are levels and levels and levels. So anything we're saying is only a suggestion. We can't right. claim to understand what Rabbi Nachman meant. And, and, and we're all right. And we need everybody's perspective, you right. know. Right. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else's and yours as well. You know, we're all, we're all in this together. We're on the journey together. Right. Um, but but one of the interpretations that we take in the in the book is that the giants are the are the, are the are the hurdles that we encounter along this search, along this search to discover something that again, like I felt in my childhood, and so many of us feel today, something's missing, and the certainty that there's hope yeah. of finding something. We don't know what it is, but there's hope of finding something. We're gonna face challenges. Right. We're gonna face cynicism. We're gonna face people on the outside. Sometimes people who know more than us, people right. who are older than us, people who, who are trying to knock us down and say what you're looking for doesn't exist. Just get real, right? You hear right. that terminology, yeah. get real. Is the real world, is the real, you know, you grow up a little bit. Yeah. You grow up. Yeah. And the ability, the ability to, to stand firm, to stand firm. And to believe that what we feel inside is valid. And that we, each and every Jewish soul is rooted, like the Zara Kaddish, the Book of Splendor teaches, each and every Jewish soul is rooted in a letter in the Torah. And it means to say that sometimes the voices within, we have to be careful, because we have a lot of voices inside. Right. But some of those voices that are compelling us toward a holiness, they're coming from the Torah we contain within. Sometimes it's not about learning something in a book. Right. It's about listening very, very deeply to what our souls are telling us. Right to stand firm by that. And the, and the idea is that oftentimes we find that these giants themselves, they come around because each giant sends the viceroy to the next brother right. and this, to the next brother until in the end, it's the final giant who sees that there indeed exists a palace of pearls and a mountain of gold. He gives him this magical wallet that anytime the viceroy sticks his hand into, he'll take money out of it. Specifically the giant, who, the most severe giant, the one in charge of the winds, the ruchas, that's the big tzaddik, the big righteous person, the big, the big, you know, Talmudic scholar right. who's telling but doesn't. It's specifically them that turn into the, the biggest assistance when we stand firm in our conviction. We don't give up. We're going right. to face challenges. That's part of the journey. Right. There's a way of revealing God's presence even there. So one of the Rabbi Nachman's always talking about uh, I think the term is spiritual stubbornness. Yeah, yeah, where, holy, holy stubbornness. Yeah, you know where you're, you're just like I messed up. I'm, no, you know, I'm not, not where I should be. That's right. Um, but you're standing firm. Like I'm not going anywhere, God. I'm like right mm -hmm. here. I'm moving forward either way. Um, and so that that's an attitude right there in itself that he stresses. Um, the let's talk about the, uh, the 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 wallet that you can pull everything out. What yeah. what is what is that? symbolize so the wallet is a very very deep thing you know in, in the story it's referred to with the hebrew word kli which means a vessel we call, right. I call it a wallet because that's where people keep money yeah but it's a it's a kli he gave him a, 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 a wondrous vessel that anytime he sticks his hand into it whenever he needs money because the, the place obviously a mountain of gold and a palace of pearls things are going to be super expensive yeah. and that and he's going to have an obstacle because of money it says he's going to have an obstacle so he'll need such a thing that's going to enable him whenever he sticks his hand in he's going to have the funds you know, necessary. Yeah. This word kli can be seen as a mnemonic for a couple of things. Okay. Because each Hebrew letter, even though it's a letter in and of itself, it's just a letter, but in Hebrew we have the concept of Rashi Tevos, right? Where each letter is really, can be seen as masking or containing within it a whole word. Okay. Right? And so kli is a Rashi Tevos, is a mnemonic for the three words, yiteng lecha kilbovach. Okay which means to say, God shall give you your heart's desires. The Viceroy is going to need a lot of courage. He's going to need the courage to realize that whatever he's being given is being given to him by a Kaddish Baruch because it's what he needs. And it's this endless, endless wellspring that he can dig his hand into. It's a metaphor. It's money. Yeah. It's fun, support. All of us need a vessel like that. Or no matter what we're going through, we can draw meaning. Where in any given moment, whatever our heart needs, that this specific time, like we spoke about, whether it's in time of Aliyah, when things are going well and things are clear and we're super inspired, 
or whether it's like, you know, the midwinter, I don't know how it gets the weather here in Houston, but mm-hmm. it's mid midwinter and it's just dark and it's dreary and it's cold and it's, you know, and we're feeling that way and feeling it. And we've made mistakes and we're down on the dumps and we're feeling ashamed of ourselves and guilty and broken. Yitin l'cha kilvavecha is this vessel that we're able to constantly draw upon. And that's the vessel of Emunah. It goes back, it goes right okay. back into it again. It's, it's all the princess. Everything's gotta be related to the princess because as the story speaks, the way that he's freeing her is the process we call emulative extraction, right? In the book, right. he's sort of extracting her by embodying her traits. And so he's going to need to draw on the wellsprings of Emunah to believe God is with me and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is standing by me and he's holding my hand on this journey where I came from, where I'm going, I don't know. Every person has their own journey. But at any given moment, we're there because we're exactly prepared for this moment and God is with me to be able to draw on that wellspring of meaning. Right. Is there an element of, of, of gratitude? Certainly. Yeah. Certainly, certainly, certainly. Everything goes back to gratitude because gratitude, in a way, is amuna concretized, right? right? When we're yeah. able to be grateful, it means to say that there's no greater exp- expression of faith than when I realize everything in my life is a gift right. and everything in my life is something I need to be thankful for. That's what gratitude is. And a person who's a grateful person, a person who doesn't take life for granted, a person, like we said, who takes a walk in the park, he takes a walk through godliness, you know? Yeah. He, that's, a, that's a person who appreciates every tree, who understands there's no such, no, no such thing as nature, right. human beings, because we get used to this thing called a human being. It's a wonder, eyes, it's a wonder, the ability to speak, the ability to hear. And we take these things for granted. We always say, you know, how much would a person pay if one the morning they woke up and their eyes weren't working and they, they you know, an exorbitant, right. exorbitant amount. Exactly. We shouldn't be jumping for joy that we open our eyes in the morning. We take it for granted. Yeah. It means to say we're not connected to faith. The more amuna oriented we are, we wake up in the morning, which is gratitude. Yeah. I give thanks to you, Melachai V'kayam, the living God, Shechazar, to be Neshmasi, you gave me back my soul. Rabba, emuna secha, right? Which means right. great. Is my is really emunasecha is your faith in me, my faith in you. But yeah. we see that there's a correlation between yeah. moda ani gratitude and faith. These two things are connected. Very connected. That's right. Fantastic. Uh, Rabbi, any any parting words you want to sh- share with the audience? <laughs> I want to tell each and every one of you that I don't know you, I don't know any of you, but I love you dearly, each and every one of you, and I believe that beyond this concept of each person needing to take their journey, each person needing to work on what they're working on. I want very much that I should live and that we should live with a team game mentality. It's about our collective mission. We're all in it together. No matter where you find yourself on the journey, you're just starting, you're a little bit further on, you're, you, you think you're there already, <laughs> we're all just starting. We're on this journey together. There's no hierarchical structure, you know, oh, the Orthodox Jews, they got it. And they, there's no such thing. We're mission oriented. Every person, wherever you are at that moment, you have an opportunity to connect yourself to the mission, to learn a little bit more, to connect a little bit more, to find God a little bit more. Speak to him in your own words is another very important element where the viceroy uses this concept of Rabbi Nachman, his spodidos, personal prayer. Speak to him in the car on the way to work. Make him real. It's all about, which we began with, a shift in perspective. And so I bless us both that we should we should all dance in the courtyard of the third Beis Hamikdash, the third temple together. But we should we should hold each other tight on these last shaky steps to the finish line. We're almost there and we're all in it together. It's really a privilege to learn with you. Thank you, Rabbi. Amen. Thank I appreciate you so much. coming on. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, you so on. much for having me. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you.